for freedom in the history of our nation. Dallas and Fort Worth. We're advancing the state of the art in every aspect. How we doing? Come on. I love it. 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 I um, just kind of start with some transparency. I feel like, uh, like I secretly want to be like James Bond. And, and here's why I say that, because um, I, I just kind of have this weird fantasy of, um, of having like a lot of guns. Okay, don't judge me, but like, like just like this like secret room full of guns or like you push a button and the wall opens up and there's, and like I have a gun, I've, I've got a couple guns, but, but I want like better guns and what's interesting about that is I don't even use the guns I have, but like I just kind of have this idea that like somebody's going to break into the house, you know, and I'm be like, yo, just push a button, wall opens up, you know, it's like. AR-15s, AK-47s, like nine millimeters, row of 40s, and, and you know, and I'm like, it's a bad idea, bro. That's a great idea. And they're like, what's that? I'm like, that's a missile launcher. <laughs> you better back, you need to chose the wrong house, you know? And so like, I want like, I want better guns. But, but what's crazy, and, and why I say that is because like, I don't even hunt or shoot. <laughs> Or hold gun. I don't do anything with guns. I, but I want like a better version of something that I have and I don't use properly. You, you catch that? Like I want a better. Let me, let me go one more with you, ladies, just in case I haven't completely lost you. Let me um, try to lose you some more. So tools, okay? Uh, I have some tools. But like I'm the kind of guy that like calls a handyman to change the light bulb. Like I don't use the tools, okay? I don't use the tools I have. But every time I get an ad, like like a Black Friday or like Home Depot ad, I'm like, dude, I need some more tools. That's what I need. I need a better sawzall. But like I've never used my sawzall. But I need a better one with a lithium battery. I need a better version of this tool that I have that I don't use. And I'm not talking about materialism tonight. I'm not talking about things or stuff. I'm talking about your job. Because your job, the one you went to today, I think for the vast majority of us is a tool that we have that we don't use. And we want a better one. You track me with like, we want a better job, which, which whatever better means to us, like probably a higher paying job, different responsibilities, more authority. We want a better job, but we don't use this tool, our current job that we have, and we want a better version of it. And what's interesting about a tool is a tool can be, can be used to build up or a tool can be used to tear down. A hammer can build a house or destroy a life. And likewise, so can your job. It can build up your life or it can destroy it. And what you don't need is a different one. You need a new perspective on the one that you have. That you would use it in the way that God has intended. I'm going to present some things to you tonight from the Bible, that God, the creator of the heavens and the earth has instructed us about our work and you're going to come to a crossroads at the end of this evening. You're going to have to decide, is he right or is he wrong? Because I think for the vast majority of you, you're going to hear some new things, some new ideas. And for some of you, you're just going to be at a crossroad. Do I need to put this into practice tomorrow or not? Or do I just want to say, hey, I reject that. I don't think that's what those scriptures mean. I don't, I don't know that that's what's going on there. But we will have to 
decide because our work is a tool. We're in this series, New Year Revolution. We're talking about how the changes that people make that change the world. Resolutions change people. Revolutions change the world. And so if we want to change the world, we need to come up with this revolutionary idea around work, which is really just God's ancient idea around the one who created work and created us to work. And so week one, two weeks ago, we talked about freedom that comes from following Jesus. We were in John chapter 10. Last week, David talked about how uh, Christianity is not optional for the world and the Holy Spirit is not optional for the Christian. And we're talking about this kind of background idea of, of a biblical worldview and that we're going through this world and we're following something greater than ourselves. And tonight, I want to talk about seeing work as a tool. Not seeing your boss as a tool. <laughs> seeing work. Seeing work as a tool. And so if we get the why we work question wrong, the why we work question wrong, you're going to go through life like so many of your peers, and you're going to find yourself desperate and wanting and depressed. I think more desperation and depression comes from a false idea of why we work than almost just about anything else I can think of. I believe our generation is notorious for this. And it's not entirely your fault. I think you've been set up for failure. And I hope to change that tonight. I'm very hopeful of the message tonight. I think if we can embrace a biblical concept of work for the rest of your years on earth, you will be set up for incredible success and a new understanding, something that you can teach others. So I, I asked if we, you follow, if we're friends on Twitter or Instagram or social media in general, I ask that you bring a pen and a piece of paper tonight because there's just gonna be a ton of scriptures. Uh, I'm gonna go throw them at you. You're gonna see that God has a lot to say about this. There's over 900 passages around work and economics in the scripture. That is more than heaven or hell, evangelism, missions, dating, marriage, conflict, raising children combined. There's more passages in the Bible on this idea of work than all of those other topics combined because God really cares about work. He really cares about this. There's something that he wants you to know that I think for so many of us, we've missed it. And missing it will destroy your life. I mean that. Not that you have the wrong job but you have the wrong perspective on, of the job you currently have. And that will mess you up. I've seen it mess up a lot of people. So I hope you lean in and I hope you hang on to what you can. It's gonna be like drinking from a, a fire hydrant tonight. Write down what you can. Just, you can stay at 30,000 foot view if you want and talk about it afterwards. We have affinity groups and you can just say, hey, let, let me make sure I heard that right and hey, what did you think about this and do you agree and what scripture did he say and you can go back and look at it. So we're gonna talk about how your job is a tool to praise, how your job is a tool to prune, how your job is a tool to provide and how your job is a tool to promote. Four points this evening and so let me just start with your job is a tool to praise. Praise means worship. So many of us think what we just did as worship. We compartmentalize this idea of worship, but your job is your greatest opportunity to worship God. Now that's a big statement. Is it true? Can I prove it? Hey, let me start with, with a couple verses for you. Exodus 34 verse 21 says, six days you shall, and the word is labor there. Psalm 104 verse 23 says, then people go out to there and the word is work. And then Exodus 8 verse 1 says, this is what the Lord says, let my people go so that they may, and the word is worship me. And then Joshua 24 verse 15 says, but as for me and my household, we will, and the word is serve the Lord. Now you can learn a lot about words. Okay, when, when one thing, an item, a noun, has a bunch of words to describe it, that's intentional in a language. And when one word describes lots of things, that is also intentional. Let's throw that back up there for just a minute. All of those words in the Hebrew is the Hebrew word avodah. Avodah, they're all the same word. Labor, work, worship, and serve. 
God says they're all the same in my economy. What you did today was an act of worship. And you think, no, no, no. When I was singing, praise the king, that was an act of worship. It was for Shane B. The Shanes in, in campuses, Fort Worth, Houston, wherever you're at, if you heard a worship leader, yeah, that was their work. And that was worship. And yeah, we, we got to take part in that worship by singing. But what you did today, I will argue from the scriptures, was more of an act of worship. Wherever you showed up corporately, commercially, that that was a greater act of worship. You don't believe me. It's, really, it's, it's, one, you, it's kind of one of those things you're like, oh yeah, preachers are supposed to say stuff like that. I'm sure that's probably true. No, it, it is knitted in who we are as human beings. Let me try to prove it. In Genesis chapter two, verse 15, God put man in the garden and he says, I want you to work it. Not like work it, but like work it. <laughs> I want you to work it. I want you to work. What's interesting about that being Genesis chapter two is that's before Genesis chapter three, which is when sin entered the world. So prior to sin entered the world in perfection that God created, work existed. And we were made in God's image. God worked for six days, rested on the seventh, made humans in his image to be a part of who he is that we would work. A part of who we are is work. It's not something we do. It's intrinsically in us. What do I mean by intrinsically in us? It's not a means to an end. To not to work is to not live. Once you cease to work, you begin to die. You begin to cease to exist as God intended you to exist. Work is who we are as human beings. We're to work. It is worship. It is praise. It is what God made us to do. And so as we move through the scriptures, what you see most often in the New Testament as an employee-employer relationship is some words that we have tremendous baggage with. It's slave master, slave master. And we see that through the lens of our gross, disgusting history in America of, of a racial slavery, slave coming over from Africa to work, the abuse that took place there, the injustice, inhumane acts that took place there. This was not a racial slavery. It is what we have closest to a employee-employer relationship in the scriptures. And you say, if I heard that as a 20-something, I'd be like, oh, okay, yeah, maybe, but it's not what it is. But you've got to think about why it is so often repeated throughout the New Testament. Why would God give us so much instructions on how to be slaves? You, you'll hear the Bible condones slavery, not the slavery that we think about. No, it's not, and it's not condoning anything. It's giving instruction to this is how you're to have a relationship with someone who is in authority over you. And if you find yourself in a place of authority, this is how you're to act. So let me read you two scriptures. Ephesians chapter six, verses five through nine. Slaves, obey your earthly masters. I want you to read that. Employees, obey your employers with respect and fear and with sincerity of heart just as you would obey Christ. Obey them not only to win favor when their eye is on you, but as slaves of Christ, doing the will of God from your heart. Serve wholeheartedly as if you were serving the Lord, not people, because you know that the Lord will reward each one for whatever good they do, whether they are a slave or free. And masters, treat your slaves. Now, if you find yourself in a position of authority over someone, employers, treat your employees in the same way. Do not threaten them since you know that he who is both their master and yours is in heaven and there is no favoritism with him. Now that was Paul writing to a specific church in a town called Ephesus. Now Paul also wrote to a church in a city called Colossae. Let me read it to you. It's going to sound familiar. Written at two different times to two different churches in two different geographic locations, God through his Holy Spirit and, and his servant Paul, scribed two letters that he preserved in the Bible for thousands of years so that we would read them today and apply them to our lives. Slaves, obey your earthly masters. 
in everything and do it not only when their eye is on you and to curry their favor, but with sincerity of heart and reverence for the Lord. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters. Since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward, it is the Lord Christ you are serving. Anyone who does wrong will be repaid for their wrongs and there is no favoritism. It's almost verbatim the same passage written two different times, two different letters, two different churches, two different geographic locations. It's like God saying, can I have your attention, please? I have something I want you to know. You're not working for your boss. I see you. I know what you're doing. I know how you're working, and it is an act of worship to me. And I see the way you treat each other, and I see what you think about your coworkers, and I see what you say behind their back, and you need to stop it because it's an act of worship to me. The message is simple work with excellence for God, not for man. Treat each other well. And I know it's a different message to swallow because you're like, what if my job sucks? You work with excellence. What if my boss is terrible? You work with excellence. What if I'm doing the same thing and I never get promoted? God sees you. There's this place called eternity. You're going to be there for a long time. Better to get promoted there than here anyways. He's dishing out the rewards. That's what he's saying over and over and over. Do we believe him? Do we believe in that that's better? It can't be that simple. I know it's not popular, but it's biblical. And so work is a form of worship. It's not an object of worship. It's a form. We don't worship our work. We worship through our work. And so my second point is your job is a tool to prune. Your job is a tool to prune. What do I mean by prune? You, you know, this is a metaphor Jesus gives us in John 15 that, that the Holy Spirit is actively sanctifying us. He is turning us into him, essentially. He's making us like Christ. And he does that through trials, circumstance, tribulations, hardships in this life. He, he does that, as the Proverbs says, as iron sharpens iron through other people. We are becoming like Jesus. And so your work is an incredible tool that the Holy Spirit uses to prune you. So that fruit would come out of your life. First Peter chapter two, verse 13 says it like this. Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human authority, whether to the emperor as the supreme authority or to governors who are sent by him to punish those who do wrong and to commend those who do right. For it is God's will that by doing, listen, this is important. By doing good, you should silence the ignorant talk of foolish people. Live as free people. Do not use your freedom as a cover-up for evil. Live as God's slaves. We see this idea again. Same words. God's slaves. Show proper respect to everyone. Love the family of believers. Fear God. Honor the emperor. Applicable. Very applicable to your Facebook post. Slaves in reverent fear of God. Submit yourselves to your masters. Not only to those who are good and considerate. But also to those who are harsh. Now, what is so interesting is, one, the scriptures acknowledge this slave-master relationship that there can be harshness that exists in that relationship. So there are certainly abusive situations. And as it repeats this slave-master relationship, what it doesn't ever say, and you got to find this curious, it never says, and if they're abusive, leave. And if, if, they, if they're really difficult to work with, you should go somewhere else. He never says, look for another opportunity. It gives zero allotment for that. Like he never ever gives instructions. And if it's a terrible work environment, get out. Why? What, what is he doing there? Now, now it's, very, it's a very simple capitalistic mindset for us to exist in a world where, hey, if we have a job and we don't like it, another one comes along, we should go. That's, that's just A to B, simple logic in America today. It's not biblical. And some of you are going to be wrestling with that for the rest of the night. So make a note, try to move forward with me, come back, we can argue later. But, but he never gives that ground. What is he doing here? So typically, 
we, you know, we're representatives, we're ambassadors of Christ. Typically, when you leave a job, it doesn't leave a great taste in your boss's mouth. Like, he's, he's not like, and I'm so glad you're leaving. You know, if it does, you were doing something terribly wrong and, and have failed your, your mission there. And so for some of us, right, we might need to quit. Now, listen, we might need to quit our jobs because we're not spiritually mature enough to stay there. And what I mean by that is we cannot represent Christ well there. We haven't gotten to that place where we're so surrendered to the Holy Spirit that we can be there with joy and suffer with joy. And so we may need to leave because we just can't, but we should start there. We just can't. I just can't live out my calling. I'm not spiritually mature enough to do so. I've got to go find something else. But for the vast majority of us, God is still sovereign and he placed you where you woke up this morning and you have a purpose there. And before you look for a better tool, make sure you're appropriately using the one you have. Your job, right? And so, I think like what we do is we get into something, it gets hard, we jump out. We get into something, it gets hard, we jump out. We get into something, it gets hard, we jump out. I did this, guys. I did that. I got a job. You know, it's always your dream job. I can't tell you how many times I've had that conversation. Oh, man, it's my dream job. I love it so much. Hey, you still working there? No, man, it was terrible. Uh, it always happens. And so I had my dream job for three months and then to learn it was terrible. Had another dream job for three months to learn that it was terrible. Jumped in another job for six months to learn that it was terrible. Can I tell you something about the season of my life? I was stagnant. There was no growth there. I was a brat. I, I can look back on that season, zero growth. Same thing with relationship. You jump in a relationship, it gets hard. You jump out. You jump in a relationship, it gets hard. You jump out. You jump in a relationship. Nobody grows that way. Nobody grows. That. You sit right where you're at and you stay there. You never grow. Because to, to grow, to become great at something takes perseverance and practice. And you've got to stay with it when you don't feel like it. That, that's what it takes to get good at something. This is why I tell my children, like, hey, you can play any sport you want, but you start, you're going to finish the season. We're not, why? Because they're not going to like it at some point. They're going to get there and have to run horses or gassers or run something or do something terrible. And they're going to be like, that was terrible. I'm out. We all have come across this. And then you quit. And then your life is marked by changing and changing and changing and changing. And no one becomes great at anything by, come, by changing. And that's what they're saying about us. That we're jack of all trades and masters of none. That's what they're saying about our generation. Because we're just constantly changing. We're learning new things, but we're not mastering anything. We're not artists because we can put colors on canvases. We're artists when we can create and recreate Beautiful images. You, Shane B. or wherever you're at, your worship leader, like, he didn't learn to play the guitar on YouTube. No, he, he went to classes and he stuck with it. And, and when he didn't feel like going, he still went. And he became a master at something. Master. You, you, to master something, you have to stick with it through that wall of I don't feel like it. I don't want to. <laughs> because if you don't, you might be naturally good at something. You will never be great at anything. At anything. To get great at something, you have to practice it. And you know what we're great at? We're great at justifying leaving. Because we practiced it. <laughs> Like some of you, you haven't even moved on. You're still thinking, wait, wait, is he saying I can never leave? Is that, like I gotta stay there? Like, certainly there's a certain situation where I can leave. We're so good at justifying. Like, what if my boss asked me to sin? If they force you to sin, leave. But not if your boss is a sinner, because he is, she is, they are. But yeah, yeah, if they're saying, hey, you can choose to sin or you can choose to quit, you quit. That's applicable to about 0.2% of you. Maybe 0.02% of you. The rest of us, we're so good at justifying the leave. And so this comes from John 15, verse 2, this idea of pruning every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that you will be even more fruitful. He, he, the pruning process doesn't feel good. It's, it's not a feel-good process, right? And so you have very few tools in your life to prune you right now. 
I'm just, I'm just telling you that. Think about the tools that you have to prune you right now. Like you have um, maybe a relationship if you're dating someone who's brutally honest with you and they will look you in the eyes and tell you why they don't want to go on that second date. That's loving. That, that can be pruning. A roommate who's honest with you, a, a, a Christ-following roommate is a great opportunity to be pruned to sit you down and say, here's why you need to start doing the dishes or like stop being so gross or something like that. That can be pruning. But as I think about it, like the greatest opportunity you have for pruning is a boss, especially a difficult one. And so like as I look back on the biggest season of my life, the greatest tool that I had for sanctification was an unbelieving boss. And so I need to apologize to you guys for something. Because I've even taught the message, because, and I can rally you guys, like I've done it, I, I, I do this, right? The follow your passion message. Like the, the Venn diagram, like hey, here's what you're good at, and here's the greatest needs in the world, and here's what you're passionate about, and find the overlap and do that. I think I've even said that. The problem with that is unbiblical. Like, show me, follow your passion. I see work hard in the grind. <laughs> like, stick with it. E even when your boss is harsh, like, like, honor the Lord because it's an act of worship. But, but, but to follow your passion, that'll preach. And, and I can tell you, hey, be creative and, and start a one-for-one -one like Tom's or, or um, you know, Roma Boots or Warby Parker. And the world doesn't need another one-for-one -one business. The world needs faithful Christians who will stick with it in the grind. That, that they will do what is asked of them better than everybody else. In the name of the Lord Jesus, because they know it's Jesus Christ they are serving. And I know that's a little bit less inspiring than if I stood up here and I was like, follow your passions. Did you know that follow your passions, that phrase, was virtually non-existent until 1980? Now, if you're here and you're a millennial, you were born between 1980 and 2000, we've grown up under the banner of follow your passion. Before 1980, virtually it was in no print, no book. It didn't exist your grandfather did not follow his passions. He, he didn't even follow his wiring. He didn't wake up and like, man, what am I supposed to do? Your great-grandfather. You know, let me, you know what, I, I guess I'll take Strengths Finder and find out what my five biggest strengths are, Myers-Briggs and Disc, and maybe I'm a lion or an otter or a beaver. I don't know, what should I do? <laughs> he didn't do that. He was like, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm a farm, because there's a tractor and this needs to be farmed, so let me get in that. He never asked the question that we're asking. And his circumstance wasn't nearly as good as yours, but his satisfaction was what's higher. What's happened? Because you, you would think with all of these tests and these assessments that we could take and all of this consideration that would, can not only like match.com, match us with our perfect partner, eHarmony, whatever, but, but match us with our perfect job based on who we are. And we spend so much time thinking about that. What was I created to do? You were created to work. That's what you were created to do. So do it well with excellence in the grind. And so you're thinking right now, yeah, JP, but well, you get to do your job. What, this? You get to follow your passions. This, this is two hours of my 55 hour week. For two hours, I get to shout at you in the name of Jesus Christ. <laughs> I'll leave here. I'm gonna have a hundred emails from you. People are gonna say very mean things. They're gonna say your glasses were stupid. That's what I'm gonna get. And I'm gonna read it. You know, I'm gonna pray for you. I'm going to try not to get discouraged, and I'm going to go back and tell somebody else about Jesus. I'm going to sit with the sick and the hurting. And that's how I, this is not how I spend my week. I mean, never mind the 15 hours of preparing for what you see. The grind. The grind. Honor God in the grind. Our circumstances are better than our great-grandfather's, but our perspective is worse. Have we gotten more satisfied than that generation? No, we're more depressed. We're sadder. We're more desperate. It's the perspective that's off. It's not the wrong job. It's the wrong 
perspective. We want our job to offer us status and excess. And all that strategy is doing is leaving us discontent and depressed. We want our job to offer us status and excess. And it's leaving us discontent and depressed. And so you're like, I got to find a job I love. If you were meant to love your job, they wouldn't have to pay you to be there. I mean, think about it. Like, it's really bribery. Like, hey, if you'll do this, because we know nobody else wants to, (laughs) we will pay you this amount of money in exchange. But if it was like a job you love, you would do it for free. You wouldn't need the money, right? But no, it's an agreement. Commerce helps the world go around. Thirdly, your job is a tool to provide. Speaking of money, your job is a tool to provide. Provide for who? First Timothy chapter five, verse eight. Let me give you four groups of people to provide for. Anyone who does not provide for their relatives, circle relatives, and especially for their own household has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. Can you think of a worse admonishment in the scriptures? If you don't do this, you've denied the faith and you're worse than an unbeliever. It's like, wow, that's a little harsh. But, but it was a saint. Like, do you think about your siblings' needs as your needs? Do you think about your uncle who lost his job as your problem? All of us are gonna go through this weird circle of life thing where the people who took care of us, we will soon have to take care of. And so a part of your work is providing for those in your family who have need. This is biblical. It's very clear in that text. Why would God, creator of the heavens and the earth, preserve this text so that we might read it tonight? Ephesians 4 verse 28 says, anyone who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work, doing something useful with their own hands that they may have something to share with those in need. And so the second people that we provide for are for others in need. And so when we get a paycheck, we're we're not thinking, hey, what's that thing that I can buy and how can I up my standard of living? We're thinking about that that is God, sovereign God's provision for you to meet the needs of others around you. That we literally would go through this life with a perspective of I'm trying to find people who have needs that I can help. Because God allowed me to wake up this morning with health. I got out of bed. You know, I went to work. I got to use an education that I received basically because of where I was born. All into his common grace. And so how can I share that with others? 1 Corinthians 16 verse 2 says, On the first day of every week, each one of you should set aside a sum of money in keeping with your income, saving it up, so that when I come, no collections will have to be made. This is repeated through the scriptures, also 2 Corinthians 8, verses 1 through 3. It's this idea that you work to provide for the mission. If you grew up in church, it's called a tithe. That you would give to your local body, that that's a part of, like you wake up one day, I get to have these conversations too. It's like, oh, I'm an adult now. I should tithe. Well, actually, since you've been a Christian and had a dollar, you should tithe. But, but we should be a part of contributing to the mission. Now, we don't take up an offering here. I'm not going to take up an offering tonight. But I hope that all of you who follow Jesus belong to a church that you contribute to. And if you don't contribute here, this is not a guilt trip. I'm just stating the facts. I'm not asking you for anything. But know that somebody did. That somebody paid for the chair that you're sitting in, the the camera that is broadcasting me, these TVs up here, the, the facility in general. It's all been paid for by people who provided for the mission. We come in here and we get to take advantage of it. And and sadly, sometimes take it for granted that somebody worked hard to provide for the mission. And then lastly, 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 6 and verses 10 through 11. The context is this. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we command you, brothers and sisters, to keep away from every believer who is idle and disruptive. And so there's people who aren't doing anything. And not only are they not doing anything, they're slowing down productivity and the efficiency of others doing things. And it says this in verse 10. For even when we were with you, we gave you this rule. The one who is unwilling to work shall not eat. We hear that some, of, some among you are idle and disruptive. They are not busy. They are busy bodies. you got to love that. They're not doing anything. They're just talking to people who are trying to do stuff. They're gossips. They're busy bodies. They're not doing anything. The person who does not work should not eat. So we work to provide for ourselves. But let me bring something clear and square to your attention. 
the scripture's talking about the provision of food, shelter, and clothing, right? This comes from 1 Timothy 6. Whoever has food, shelter, and clothing, we should be content with these. Now, right about now, I'm just gonna pause. Let me just pause. Let me, let's recollect. Because right about now, you're overwhelmed. It sounds like we're talking about boiling the ocean. These goals are so lofty. You're, you're starting the realization. It's like, wow, if this is true, I've been doing this all wrong. It's so far from where I'm at right now. That's okay. That's okay, man. There's a reset button on life. You say a prayer. You say, God, I missed it. I, I want to have a right perspective of work. I want to love a job that I've hated now. I, I want to I use the gifts and the talents that you've entrusted to me to bring glory to you. And now what this verse is talking about is it's not talking about having a newer iPhone or a better place to live, a new apartment. It's saying you work to provide for yourself and consider what is the excess because you might be using the excess for luxuries. And so consider what is the excess. It's 1 Timothy 6, 8, if you wanna write that down. We should be content with food, clothing, and shelter is implied. When I buy something, my wife and I, we run $500 purchases through our community. We don't buy those without everybody nodding their heads saying, hey, this is a good use. Um, and when I buy something, there's a number that I track. It's 21,000 today. I look it up often. It's 21,000 is the number of people who died today because of hunger. And I realize that when I consciously choose to have a luxury, I'm consciously choosing not to care for that number, not to think about it. And so in the spirit of talking about revolution and changing the world, I'm inviting you into that process with me, that you would now be aware of that number. 21,000 people are not alive right now, but they were alive this morning, and it's because they didn't have the things that we take for granted every day. And so we cannot lose sight of our mission. What I'm trying to tell you in the spirit of worldview is we don't just work to make money to survive. The work itself is an aspect of surviving. To say it differently, the work itself is living. Like we work as an aspect of living to the glory of God is to work. You're gonna be hard pressed finding retirement in here. You're gonna be really challenged find, finding that what you have completely embraced is culturally acceptable in the scripture. That as long as man is able, he works. Lastly, your job is a tool to promote. Your job is a tool to promote the gospel specifically. One of my favorite verses in all of the scriptures, write it down, I hope you memorize it. It's Titus chapter two, verses nine and 10. Teach slaves, teach employees, to be subject to their employers in everything, to try to please them, not to talk back to them. Again, I just wanna reiterate in case you have this eye roll moment, like, yeah, that's not really what that verse is saying. It, it is why it is in the Bible. This applies to us. To try and please them, not to talk back to them, and not to steal from them. You're like, steal from them? I don't steal, I wouldn't steal, I'm a Christian. Consider that, like the time you spend on social media, like unless your boss comes to you and is like, hey, here's what I want you to do, here's the goal. You know, get on Facebook every day for at least 15, 20 minutes, that, that's gonna be a big win. <laughs> like, let's agree that if that's not the stated goal, we could put that in the category of stealing, okay? All right. And not to steal from them, but to show that they can be fully trusted, so that in every way they will make the teaching about God, our Savior, attractive. That the reason that we work is to make God attractive. And like so often, we want to leave a job, and we have claimed to be Christ followers, and we are not making Jesus attractive. It's like good riddance and other Christians out of here, because they didn't work hard anyways. And then what you're left with is all these capitalistic jerks that don't know Jesus, but they work really, really hard. And that should not be. There's something really, really broken with that. I come, if we know each other at all, I... I come from the corporate world, corporate America, and, and um, worked for, uh, in telecom for five years, and, 
and um, was on a, I was a um, account manager, had um, weekly funnel reviews, was on a sales team, and had a, a boss, and there was an, another guy, I, I was a new Christian, so uh, different season of life, but there were two Christians on the team. One guy was this kind of outspoken evangelist, always talk about Jesus, had an ichthus on his car, you know, that's the little fish thing, and, and um, just constantly, you know, talking about God, Bible right there on the desk, and, and um, he just wasn't very good at sales. <laughs> and, and so every week, my, my wall, the wall to my office and my boss's office, we shared a wall, and we would have funnel reviews. That's where you kind of go over, hey, what's gonna close, what's not, and how are you gonna hit quota and whatnot. And my boss would ask him, hey, what's your strategy? And every week, I'd hear him say, well, I don't know, man, my strategy is hope, you know? And uh, good Sunday school answer. And, uh, and so one day my boss just lost it with him because he was not performing. And he's just like, hope is not a strategy. And I was like, he's kind of right, it's not. And, and, uh, and it sounds really good. Like if you're talking in church, like, hey, we believe in God and he's gonna do it. But here's the deal, this guy was lazy. And he wasn't making the teachings of Jesus Christ attractive. And there was another guy on our team who wasn't an outspoken evangelist, but he was a very diligent worker. Like he, he did everything that was asked of him. He went above and beyond. Everybody else on the team respected him. And that boss came up on a hard time. His dad got sick. And I watched who he reached out to. He reached out to a Christian, but it wasn't the outspoken, overzealous, underperforming Christian. It was the diligent Christian who worked hard, and that Christian shared the gospel with him. I believe he became a Christian. I believe he trusted Christ, not because somebody was an evangelist, but because of his hard work. That's a picture of this Titus 2.10. That's the dichotomy. That's what you live and exist in. And so, so often I talk to people and they're like, man, I'm just being held back because of my faith and being oppressed and persecuted. And man, I should have got that promotion, but I didn't because I'm a Christian. And I don't buy it most of the time. And, and so maybe, I mean, maybe that's the case. But in capitalistic America... I mean, it, your boss would have to be about not making money, you know, to do that. It would have to be, well, there's one person that would make me a lot of money if I promoted them, but they like Jesus, so I'm going to hold them down, and I'm just going to be a little more poor because I hate Jesus that much. I guess that's possible, but just consider what else might be going on there. You might have a blind spot, and there might be people around you who don't love Jesus, but they're working a lot harder than you are. And they're getting better and they're pushing through the difficulties. And so maybe you don't have to email me why your case is unique and you really were persecuted. I believe you. I, you know, regardless of what I just said, I believe you. <laughs> and so um, we work to promote the gospel. Like, just consider how profound this is. Like the gospel's always moved forward on work. It's always advanced on commerce. Like that's how the gospel has spread from one nation to another, to another, to another. The road that the gospel has traveled on is commerce, it's work, it's careers, it's occupations, it's professionalism. That's how the gospel's moved forward. Let me explain it. Let me, let me explain what I mean. If I want to share Jesus, let's say I want to go to Saudi Arabia to talk about Jesus. And so I'm going to go and, and try to get a visa or I go to the airport and they're, customs, they're going to say, so why are you coming? I'm like, because I want to talk about Jesus. They're going to be like, eh. no, you're not. I'm not going to Saudi Arabia. They're not going to let me in. I can't get in there to talk about Jesus. But if I go to Saudi Arabia today because I want to buy oil or I've got some tool that's going to help them mine minerals more efficiently, or I've got a plan to talk about how they can make money there, like they're going to welcome me with open arms. And while I'm there and being excellent at what God has made me to do, I can talk about Jesus. And, and you know what happens when you help people <laughs> using your skills to help people? They want to listen to you. They lean in and tell me more about this Jesus. You know, that's, what, that's the way that it works. The gospel has always moved on commerce. Work hard so that you make the teachings of Jesus attractive. Let me go one more with you. When I was in corporate America, I worked on the eighth floor of AT&T. To get to my desk, I had to walk through two security checkpoints. I have a security badge, you know that one that kind of stretches out and 
comes back, has my picture on it right there. Had to put it on my belt every day. Like if I forgot that, you had to go home and get it. Like there's no, I can't get in without it, right? And so every day through those two security checkpoints to get to my desk, to sit at my desk, I can't go there today, guys. I can't, I'm not allowed. I could go to Saudi Arabia today easier than I could the eighth floor of AT&T. I was there every single day of my life, but today, no matter how bad I want to, no matter how hard I try, I'm not getting to the eighth floor of AT&T, but that's where I was, that was my mission field, that's where God had me. Where does God have you? Because I can't get there in that classroom or that public school. I can't get there behind the counter of the bank. They'll shoot me or arrest me or something. I can't get there behind the counter of that coffee shop or wherever it is that you were today, that grocery store, whatever you do, every day. I can't go there, but you're there. God has you there. The gospel moves forward on business, on work. God made us intrinsically to work. That's how it moves. That's how Christ has become famous in the world. And so in summary, your work is a tool to praise Your job is a tool to prune. Your job is a tool to provide. And your job is a tool to promote. Guys, it was work, and I changed it to job. I spoke this morning with one of the leading worldview teachers on the planet, and I was talking to him about this message and biblical worldview. And he he was just like, you can't say work is a tool. Work's not a tool. Like, work is the essence of who we are as being made in the image of God. Your job, that's a tool. Work, it's not a tool. Work is who we are. It's a, it's a part of our identity wrapped up in the image of God. <clears throat> and so this, what I want you to do is, uh, the best way for me to explain to you what a biblical worldview, because that's so important in understanding how to put this message, how to fit this message in your life. The biblical worldview is, is like, so like, let's just say you're like, man, I want to have two kids one day. I want two kids. I hope it's a boy. I hope it's a girl. Like, you ever had these conversations, usually long before you should, with somebody you're dating in high school or something? It's like, yeah, I want, I'm going to name him Tyler and her Jennifer. I mean, anyways, just me? Okay. And, uh, <laughs> and so you have these, but, but a biblical worldview starts with this. God, how many kids should I have? Because like, if this book says 15, then I guess I'm going to be on a, sitcom or something, just the 16 of us, I don't know, right, 17 of us, uh, you ask like, hey, when should I date, when should I get married, why well, I want to get married when I'm this age, wait, how, how old does this stay, because if like there's a God, he created everything, and he has a plan, and he's spoken to it, like I've got to start with the Bible, and so when you're like, you know, well, should I get a new job, should I move, should I change jobs, should I do this, like, well, well hold, hold on, what? does this say? That, that's a biblical worldview. It's a lens. Well, let me just, I can't see without these. Like without them, I just see kind of blur colors. I can't see without my glasses. And everything's in focus. And so if I didn't have glasses, I would go through the world. And if no one ever, if I didn't even know of the concept of glasses, I would just think this is what the world looks like. But right now I'm in a danger of falling off the stage because I can't see. And so what happens when I put these on, I look like Napoleon Dynamite. No, no, that's not what happened. <laughs> when I put these on, everything comes into focus. Stay with me. Everything comes into focus. And I begin to see things. As it should be seen. I see you've got a checkered shirt on there. Or gingham, I guess they call it. I see your white hat. I, see, I didn't a while ago. It's just a blur. I see you back there in the red. And I see you up there in the blue. I see that. I see things as it was meant to be seen. In the focus of, of, of the way that it's intended to be. That's a biblical worldview. The essence of seeing your work as a part of who you are the aspect that you work and and that it's an act of worship to the one who created you in his image as one who works, that's a biblical lens. It changes the conversations that you have at your work. 
that you were created by a God who loves you, but in the fall, everything was lost. And, and the work was not cursed, but the ground you work was cursed. It fights against you and produces thorns and thistles. And all of a sudden, drudgery enters the picture. And that as a follower of Jesus Christ, knowing the one true God, that you're going to be with him forever and ever and ever, your job now with a biblical worldview is to present commercials of that place. That you would show people glimpses of heaven by the things that you produce through your toil. That they would say, oh, that's what heaven's going to be like. And the way that you produce that with joy. That you didn't see it as just taking mortgage applications. You saw it as providing someone a home and a new life. And you don't see it as just creating a lesson plan. You see it as discipleship of a classroom of 32. You don't see it as just serving a mocha frappuccino. You see it as an interaction with another human being and an opportunity to show them how they can live forever. That, that changes everything. You're redeemers. You're putting the world back together in the image of God. You're image bearers. You are picking up the broken pieces. And when you go through life and you think, I just want to make more money so I can buy more stuff, you are under the influence of Satan. You are under the influence of the prince of this air. You are buying into a satanic message and you're missing out on your purpose and you're going to die having missed your purpose. Can you think of a greater tragedy? And you're not going to be happier. Statistically, what else do we need to know? It's not making anybody happier. I pray you live out your purpose, man. You would live out your calling. Not trying to find this nuanced, very narrow path for yourself to walk. But to in the grind worship God and become great at something. Maybe something different that you never would have said, I want to be great at that. But that you'd be an example to make the teaching of Christ, your Savior, attractive. Father, would you help us in that? You tell us in Colossians 3, that whatever we do, whether in word or deed, that we're to do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to you through him. And so would you help us do that, that whatever we do in word or deed, that we do it in your name for your glory. That we would avodah you. In our work and in our toil. In our labor, in our worship, in our service. Father, would you take the things that I said that are inconsistent with your word. And before they get up to worship you, Lord, would you allow them to forget it? The things that I said that was me and, and modern wisdom and just the the ideas of man, that they forget it before they stand up. But the things that I said that are consistent with your Holy Spirit and your word and your desires for their life, would you please, God, not let them shake them, not let them forget them, uh, grab them with their hearts and the soul of a human being and allow their lives to be transformed, that we would no longer conform to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of our minds so that we might be able to test and approve what your will is, your good pleasing and perfect will, not where should I work, but tomorrow, how should I work? And when they show up, allow them to put on the lens of a biblical worldview and to do so with excellence. In Christ's name, amen.